kidding me? Oh. Whatever you think you're doing, you know it's good for you. Let it go. If the train don't kill me, the people will. Tell me about it. Each day, Michael McCauley follows the same routine. Before embarking on his daily commute, he spends time with his wife, Karen, and son, Danny. Together, they tackle Danny's literature assignments. Following this, Karen gives him a lift, during which they discuss tuition expenses and express hopes of managing the payments. At the train station, where Karen drops him off, they part ways. This ritual has persisted for a decade. Throughout his daily commute, Mike often engages in conversations with fellow commuters like Wall. Despite being a life insurance salesman, his life takes an unexpected turn when his boss summons him, revealing that he's being laid off after a decade of service. Despite Mike's pleas, highlighting his two mortgages, his son's college expenses, and five years until retirement, he is terminated. The news leaves Mike in a state of confusion. Living paycheck to paycheck with Karen, he faces an uncertain future. Later, Karen calls Mike, inquiring about upcoming payments and asking about his day. In an attempt to shield her from the harsh truth, he avoids disclosing the recent layoff. He decides to visit a bar, where he encounters his longtime friend, Officer Alex Murphy, who once served as Mike's partner during his detective days. While engaged in conversation, a TV report airs about a city planner allegedly taking his own life a few nights ago. Admitting to Alex that he hasn't yet informed Karen about his job loss, they discover that their disliked former colleague, Dave Hawthorne, has become a captain. Parting ways with Alex, Mike shares a sentiment, doing the right thing will get you killed, emphasizing the lack of true nobility in their profession. At the station, during a bag check, Mike overhears a man on the phone expressing hesitation. Meanwhile, a disgruntled regular commuter voices complaints before boarding. As if things couldn't get worse, a collision occurs inside the train, leading Mike to realize his phone is missing. A passerby discusses something significant happening tonight. Tensions rise as a Hispanic woman appears distressed, the air conditioning is off, and a quarrel ensues between a girl and a boy. An elegantly dressed man loudly boasts about his expensive suit, objecting to a girl's inexpensive perfume. Seeking a quieter spot, Mike sits down, joined by a woman named Joanna. Following a casual chat, Joanna reveals to Mike that there's a compartment on the train containing $25,000 and another with $75,000 in cash. She offers him the money under the condition that he assists in identifying someone on the train who doesn't belong there. The target is someone carrying a stolen item in a bag, identified by the nameprint friend. The deadline for this task is until they reach the last stop in Cold Spring. Joanna emphasizes the need for discretion, hinting that she's aware of Mike's past as a cop. Surprised by this revelation, Mike checks the designated compartment and discovers the cash. Contemplating taking the $25,000 and leaving the train, he is interrupted by a young woman claiming ownership of the money. Despite her protest, Mike decides to keep it. In a surprising twist, the woman hands him an envelope, revealing Karen's wedding ring. Without his own phone, Mike borrows one from another commuter, Tony. Seeking help, Mike approaches Walton, asking for his paper. He writes a note urging Walton to call the police as his family is in danger, all while feeling the unsettling gaze of a man behind him. Leaving the note with Walton, Mike attempts to contact Karen but fails. Trying Alex next, he encounters the same outcome but leaves a voicemail. As Walton exits the train, Mike spots a man he had seen boarding earlier rushing in with a bag. Joanna contacts Mike, diverting his gaze outside. Observing Walt preparing to approach the police across the street, a collaborator of Joanna intervenes, shoving Walt in front of a bus, resulting in his demise. Joanna sternly warns Mike that attempting to flee will lead to a similar fate. She instructs him to locate print in a bag they hold, implant a tracking device in it, and discreetly slip it into his pocket. Returning Tony's phone, Mike checks Cold Springs Zone, Zone 7. He scans the passenger destinations, seeking a stamp on Zone 7. Marking various individuals, the man in a red shirt, an empty seat, a Hispanic woman, an African-American man, a girl with colored hair, and the stockbroker, Mike approaches the stockbroker due to his unfamiliarity on the train, despite having Zone 7 on his ticket. Confused by Mike's assumption about heading to Cold Spring, the stockbroker insults him, questioning why he thinks he's bound for Cold Spring and disparaging his financial status. Unfazed, Mike responds with a gesture and shifts his focus to the girl. Initiating a conversation, she abruptly excuses herself. Unyielding, Mike follows, discovering she carries fake IDs for her boyfriend. Observing a sign, Mike devises a plan. He approaches a conductor, pointing out individuals he finds suspicious and proposing a bag search for everyone bound for Cold Spring. 
the conductor targets the Hispanic woman under the guise of a security check, leading to a scuffle. Amidst the chaos, Mike spots the tattooed man from the first stop, also headed to Cold Spring. Following him, Mike confronts the tattooed man, who attacks him in retaliation. Mentioning Prin raises the man's suspicions, sparking a continued struggle until Mike strategically concedes to allow placement of a tracker. Believing he has completed the task, Mike takes a moment to exhale. Meanwhile, Tony receives a call, realizing it's for him. Answering, he finds Alex on the line, who reassures him that agents have been dispatched to check on his family. Mike shares the entire ordeal, Prin, the $100,000, Walt's demise, and the threat to his family. Alex reveals that a witness, using Prin's name, claims to have witnessed two men throwing a city official to his death. This revelation dawns on Mike, realizing Prin is in danger, and he's being set up. As the train enters a tunnel, the call abruptly ends. At Cold Springs, two agents await the witness, noting that the train is about 20 minutes away. Mike continues pacing between cars, causing unease among passengers. In an empty car, he opens the bag belonging to the tattooed man, finding his personal items and a missing gun. A ringing phone leads him to discover the body of the tattooed man, revealing him as an FBI agent. Answering the phone, Joanna accuses Mike of misidentifying the person, leading to the agent's death. Concerned about his family, Mike inquires, and Joanna reassures him, linking their safety to his cooperation. Joanna activates the microphone on Karen's phone, allowing Mike to eavesdrop on a man at their house claiming to be there on Mike's behalf. Joanna interrupts the transmission, urging him not to leave the train and avoid detection. The train halts for an investigation prompted by passengers reporting Mike's suspicious behavior. Hiding with the body during the police search, Mike attempts to open a door, but it proves futile. Crawling down, the train unexpectedly starts moving. Despite jumping down and rolling between the wheels, he manages to reboard, only to find his bag stuck. Pulling it back, all the cash scatters, leaving only a hundred. Joanna calls again, indicating two more stops until cold springs. Desperation sets in for Mike. He takes decisive action, turning off the air conditioning in all cars except the last one. As all passengers migrate to the final car, Mike orchestrates a meeting with the man in the red shirt and Tony for a card game. Curious about the red shirt's presence on the train, Mike's inquiry is met with a swift dismissal. Elevating his voice, he shares his recent job loss and the challenge of informing his wife. He delves into a hypothetical scenario involving an outsider on the train with a bag, mirroring the situation Joanna presented earlier. When Tony questions his course of action, Mike contemplates gathering all remaining passengers in one car and proposing this scenario. Admitting to already taking the money, Mike suspects that five commuters might be Prin, as he has never seen them on the train before. Realizing the man playing cards with Tony is a regular monthly commuter, Mike shifts his attention to a guitarist named Oliver, following him into an empty car. Discovering Oliver is not Prin but an assassin allied with Joanna sent to kill Prin, Mike engages in a fierce struggle. Breaking a window during the scuffle, Oliver attempts to push Mike out, but Mike gains the upper hand, ultimately throwing Oliver out instead. Joanna contacts Mike, urging him to take the gun as it's either Prin or his family at stake. The man in the fancy suit departs one stop before Cold Springs, narrowing the suspects to two. Having already ruled out the girl with colorful hair, Mike now focuses on Eva, the Hispanic woman receiving frequent messages on her phone. Seating himself across from Eva, Mike inquires about her destination, but she deflects his question. Suspecting she's in contact with Joanna, he takes her phone, holding her at gunpoint to force the truth. Terrified, Eva admits to having a disagreement with her boyfriend, and Mike apologizes upon realizing her sincerity. Gradually, Mike discards his previous suspicions about Prin. Recollecting a young woman changing seats on the way to Cold Spring, he approaches her. Unaware of the situation due to listening to music, the girl, Sophia, becomes Mike's focus. Prin, it turns out, is derived from her reading of the Scarlet Letter and its protagonist, Hester Prin. Joanna calls again, pressuring Mike to either kill Sophia or disclose her identity. Mike, steadfast, refuses, prompting Joanna to reveal her affiliation with powerful individuals. Despite her persistent requests, Mike remains resolute in his refusal. Proclaiming imminent doom for everyone, she prompts Mike to seek help from one of the conductors, Sam. Mike urges Sam to stop the train for survival, but when Sam pulls the brake, it unexpectedly explodes. The train barrels on, passing the two FBI agents at Cold Spring. The engineer succumbs to the impact, leaving the train unstoppable. Attempts to detach their car from the rest fail initially, but with Sam's assistance, Mike eventually frees the car, though still connected by a chain. 
Seizing an opportunity, Mike jumps onto another car, accompanied by Sam wielding an axe. While striving to release the chain, the train begins derailing, causing the front section to crash and go airborne. Just in time, they manage to release the chain, hurling Mike onto the last car. Sam, however, remains in the crashing cars. The man in the red shirt pulls Mike into their car as it too derails, screeching to a bumpy halt on the train yard's edge. Amidst panic, Mike regains control, firing his gun to get everyone's attention. He reassures them that it's not over and instructs everyone to grab newspapers and dampen windows for cover. Once calm is restored, Mike queries Sophia about anything valuable the villains might seek. Sophia reveals a flash drive containing information known to a city planner, a friend of hers. Sophia reveals she refrained from going to the police because the assailants were law enforcement officers. She discloses witnessing one of them and recalls their mention of being noble. Baffled, Mike queries the meaning of noble. Sophia discloses that the sole person aware of this is Agent Garcia. The police, under the assumption that Mike has taken passengers hostage, arrive outside. Dave, his former colleague, urges him to surrender over the loudspeaker. Attempting to maintain order, Mike calms everyone as Alex arrives, endeavoring to pacify him. Assisting a large group of passengers in exiting, a few remain after disposing of a wire. Dave instructs Mike to trail an individual tagged in blue on the train. Mike seeks information from Alex about the conspiracy, prompting Alex to reference the phrase there's no such thing as noble, previously mentioned by Sophia. This revelation implicates Alex, initially met with denial but eventually followed by an admission of setting Mike up, driven by the knowledge that Mike needed the money. Encouraging Mike to surrender for the sake of his family, Alex goes in search of Prin. In a tense moment, Sophia refrains from revealing herself, and Mike, despite pressure, refuses to expose her. Passengers begin claiming to be Prin, creating chaos. Mike and Alex engage in a brawl, and outside, police attempt to get a clear shot at Mike. Seizing an opportunity, Mike snatches Alex's tracking device, deceiving the police. When Alex brandishes his gun, Dave orders snipers to take the shot, eliminating him. The SWAT team enters as Agent Garcia assures Mike of his family's safety, revealing the arrest of three men outside his house. Sophia provides a witness statement to FBI agents, while other passengers hail Mike as a hero. Reunited with his family, Mike returns his wife's ring and converses with Dave. Dave suggests a potential return to Mike's former detective role and hints at investigating Alex and his potential accomplices. In a subsequent scene, Michael is back on the train, where he encounters Joanna. Although she feigns ignorance, Michael suspects her involvement in his firing and orchestrating Sophia's presence for a purpose. Believing she deceived both him and Alex, Joanna queries Michael about the outcome, prompting him to reveal his detective badge. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell if you want to watch more videos like this. Thank you for watching and see you again soon. Take care.